think that, uh, especially with the introduction that we got this morning, we're all looking at these super tall buildings, very slender buildings, and I think we've all realized now that it's no longer a challenge of increasing lateral stiffness of these buildings, but it has become the dynamics of a very slender system. And I think one of the changes and one of the things that uh, are going to lead to more efficient designs is to stop trying to increase the structure, but rather look at this as a slender, vibrating body, and the most effective way to control its response is really adding damping. Okay, so the points that I'd like to cover is just go over what I think are challenges facing sort of the future of high-rises as they're getting more slender, and then I'll talk a little bit about the system that we developed to address these. So number one, the wind vibrations, I think uh, motion perception issues, an increase in design wind loads because of dynamic effects. We're looking at buildings now where the dynamic portion of the wind loads is reaching 70% of those wind loads. So really, if you can affect and reduce that dynamic response, you could really uh, reduce the total wind loads. And seismic performance, I think this is one of the issues that is the most overlooked. When people are building these tremendously tall, very expensive towers, I don't think that they really understand what their buildings are going to look like after a design level earthquake. There are reports of a number of buildings in the Chilean earthquake, coupled shear wall buildings that looked very uh, fine from the outside, but that were actually torn down because the amount of damage distributed over the height of the structure was so much that it was not worth repairing. So basically the resilience or the ability to repair these buildings to moderate and large earthquakes I think should be at the center of how people are looking at the future of designing high-rise buildings. The other issue that was touched upon by the previous speakers is the low inherent damping and also the trend for increasingly slender designs with limited space to add more structure to address this. So really the starting point of our research, and it's been now almost a decade that we've been developing this system, is um, the need for a more robust wind and earthquake damping system that does both at the same time uh, that we think will enable some of these uh, structures to go up. So this is a really nice video off the um, of YouTube, this is somebody sitting on a building in Tokyo and actually filming uh, after this major earthquake that happened is 300 plus kilometers away. So I think I'd just like to show this video for two reasons. One, these buildings, they don't only move on our models and on in our minds, but they actually move quite a bit if they're excited. And secondly, there's reports, especially a very interesting study coming out of Japan, for 15 minutes of free vibrations following this earthquake of these tall buildings. I can tell you from an earthquake engineering perspective, nobody is looking at the response of elements under 15 minutes of sustained or very high amplitude vibration. So I think this is an area that's going to have to be looked at very carefully, especially with respect to low cycle fatigue of elements undergoing such large vibrations. The other reason why I think this is interesting is I got some of my students to look at this and measure the vibrations and estimate the amount of damping just from the free decay that we observe on the video. And you find that it's not more than half to 1% damping. Okay, again, this is about half of what designers are using worldwide. So this should be a reason uh, of concern. Now here's a uh, chart. This was from the uh, CTBUH uh, report. And now recently we've had a large number of studies, especially coming out of Asia, buildings that have been instrumented, where we're seeing that over 200 meters or so, we are way below this 2% inherent damping that is being used in wind tunnel studies. And although for earthquake loading this may not be that much of an issue because when your structural elements are yielding and cracking during seismic loading, the damping developed by the in, uh, hysteretic response of the system is way beyond this 2%. But for wind loading and for structures that are highly dynamic, this can result in significant underestimation of your dynamic effects. Okay, so this is a, a, a serious reason for concern. So damping is known now to decrease with height. I uh, don't have time to get into the mechanics of this, but there's a very good physical reason why this happens. Um, basically, there's a plateau as the amplitude increases. There's also some recent studies that are showing that perhaps, as people thought the damping would increase with increasing amplitude, they're finding that for these very slender towers, it actually caps off very early and may even decrease at increasing amplitudes. Again, concern for the levels of inherent damping. 
Um, as I mentioned previously, the levels of actual inherent damping are lower than what is typically used, which is one and a half to two percent. Uh, the AIJ, AIJJ in Japan has already revised these to 0.8% for SLS, service load, and ultimate load wins. Uh, it hasn't been done in North America yet, and I can tell you there's discussion both in the U.S. and Canada to revise these roughly at these levels or maybe slightly higher. So uh, why, uh, what's the effect of damping? So if we look at just this example here of uh, a structure that has inherent damping between half and 1%, this is a prediction of the acceleration and the base moment. And we can see here that just adding 2% damping has a tremendous effect on this dynamic response. Again, coming back to that question, why are we trying to address this problem using increased stiffness rather than increased damping? And just very briefly here, as you know, the wind response is a combination of a dynamic and a static response. For highly dynamic buildings, this one dominates the response. And in general, in a simplified form, the dynamic response is a function of 1 over the square root of the damping. So very simply, if you look at this line here, these would be responses. This is an 85-story tower in Toronto that we studied. And you can see here that with 0.8% inherent damping, uh, we have a dynamic response that is just factored here at 1.93, an acceleration of 29 millig's and a torsional velocity of 5.8. And just increasing this to 3% goes down roughly 50% in the total dynamic response. And you can see that the other quantities are following. So really a very effective way to reduce the dynamic response of these buildings. So the previous speakers spoke about uh, these uh, sloshing dampers. Uh, really they're vibration absorbers. They work as dampers when they're properly tuned. It's just very different than what I'll be presenting, which is real viscous damping distributed throughout the height of the structure. And uh, there are a few challenges, including the uh, design that is quite complicated. The fact that it's tuned to a single mode or that you need multiple of these. And I think the biggest issue is just that uh, what happens during a major earthquake. And we're not talking about earthquakes that are very low. We're talking about earthquakes where the structures undergo severe inelastic action, a severe difference in the period. We're talking yielded periods could be twice or more uh, the period of the elastic structure. So I think really um, there are some challenges with respect to these systems. The last point that I think is very important is I mentioned this previously. This is a detail from a publication by John Wallace at UCLA, looking at coupling beams that are being used now on the West Coast in North America. And you can see here the type of reinforcement that you need to actually make this a uh, seismic resistant design. This is capacity design, so you can imagine the forces generated by this coupling beam must be transferred into these walls. So it's a tremendous design challenge to make this work. Um, and really, here are some pictures of some coupling beams after the earthquakes. So once again, the structure met its design goal. This is perfect response according to the intended response under this earthquake. But imagine you have three, four hundred of these coupling beams throughout your structure. You may have to, it may be more economical to demolish it than to repair all of this. Even, I mean, another problem is you don't even really know how much an elastic deformation has been imposed in these elements. So this is the system that we've worked on uh, developing for a while now. So the whole idea is uh, as damping, as you know, won't get into the mathematics of it, but it's an integral of the damping force over the displacement. So really looking at these tall buildings rather than putting braces, which have been used in shorter buildings, what happens to a brace is when you get flexural deformations of tall buildings, the brace just moves as a rigid body, it doesn't actually engage. So by putting these in lieu of coupling beams, you're actually making the damper work at the location where you have the highest force demand and highest displacement demand. So the idea here is these uh, layered uh, viscoelastic uh, material layers with steel plates. And if you think of them as two forks that are interlaced and connected with the viscoelastic material, and if you look at the kinematics of these buildings, when the building sways laterally, you're engaging the viscoelastic material and dissipating energy. Uh, what's really interesting about this is that viscoelastic materials have both an elastic restoring force and a viscous force. So the coupling effect that is really critical to the response of coupled shear walls is maintained in the dynamic range. So you're still going to get, we're going to develop forces here that are similar 
So the total coupling beam forces that you would expect in a conventional structure, the only difference is that when this is loaded back and forth, it displays a viscous effect which dissipates energy. So this is a, an exaggerated figure showing the kinematics of these structures and you can see as it sways one wall is rotating and the other creates a differential motion and this shears the viscoelastic material uh, uh, basically adding damping and giving this viscoelastic response. Now what do we do? How do we get a system that works efficiently for, vi for wind and for earthquake? Well you have to move away from viscoelastic and you have to go towards viscoelastic plastic for extreme loading. So the way the damper is designed is for design or service level wind and even high wind, it works as a viscoelastic system, which is characterized by this elliptical response. And when you overload the system, the steel connecting elements, which were basically just sitting there, have now been detailed to develop plastic hinges, which can now cap off the forces, ensure that you don't rip out the dampers from your connections in an extreme event, and also make sure that you don't overload the of VE material layers and tear them off. Okay, so this would be the viscoplastic. You'll see some tests. We actually ca I call this the cat eye hysteresis because it's no longer elliptical, looks more like a cat eye as you go further. Now, what is the performance uh, for these systems? We're looking for wind and frequent earthquakes with the added damping and no damage. We reduce accelerations, drift, velocities, and forces. That's coming from the damping. There is viscoelastic response and no damage. And for the maximum credible earthquake, we get an equivalent performance to ductile systems that have quite a bit of energy dissipation. But the difference here is that the VCD, this viscoelastic coupling damper, is a replaceable unit. So you can come in and remove it and not have to go in and repair and assess what the steel has done in your coupling beams. So this is just some of the tests. We've done uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of tests over 10 years on different elements. So this is just a small sample. And you can see here the viscoelastic material undergoing about, in this case, about 100% shear. And what we did is we characterized the frequency and strain response, wind and earthquake response. We calibrated simplified models and also developed some pretty sophisticated models that account for all of the behavior and interaction between frequency, strain, and temperature that these materials display. Uh, we then moved on to some very large tests. I believe these are probably the largest, uh, well, some of the largest tests ever done in viscoelastic materials. So we built half this wall here. So imagine this is the center line, so your wall would be twice as large. We have the height of one floor. And what we did here is we built these specimens, and we can remove the top, drop in the specimen, and PT everything together to the setup. And these actuators apply lateral loading that actually impose the racking deformation that characterizes the movement of these tall uh, building or coupled walls. So this is a picture. Here's Mike Montgomery. Here, when he was doing his PhD on this, this is one of the dampers, and you can see here the setup with the actuators ap applying the racking motion to the system. So here's a deformed shape. You can see the plates in this wall moving down, the plates in the other wall that are interlaced moving up, and this is basically showing the VE material that is sheared during the response. So I'll show you a video now. This is an 85-story building that's been modeled, and we've taken the deformation that is applied to the walls, and you'll see here that um, you'll get a, uh, the motion going through the damper and the higher frequency here is because of the higher frequency response of the tall building and once again you can see the um, viscoelastic and also viscoelastic plastic response when you overload the system. So imagine, I'll show you pictures, this is at the end of a design level or, or rather closer to a maximum credible event and so you would compare this to some of the pictures I showed you previously in terms of damage coupling lintels. So now uh, we'll see some more extreme loading. You're going to see the steel elements here yielding. And you can see here that the system caps off the forces. It no longer behaves as an elliptical viscoelastic system, but caps off the response. Again, you would be seeing rebar if you had applied this type of loading to a coupling beam. Thanks. So this is a picture of the damper tested. Uh, maybe each one of them was put through 10 or so earthquakes. Uh, not a lot of damage in it. And here is a coupling beam uh, that was a picture taken in uh, Chile after the uh, Concepcion earthquake. So once again, very different performance. Now one thing, as you know, the World Trade Center towers had about 10,000 viscoelastic dampers in them. So this is not a new thing. There's 
thousands of brace dampers that have been implemented in Taiwan in shorter shear type buildings, etc. One of the main concerns that's been reported in the literature is the temperature dependence. The good thing about implementing this in tall buildings is the long period, the low frequency response, makes these effects very small. In fact, in an entire windstorm for a couple of hours, we would expect about three to six degrees, or at least we saw in our tests, of increase in temperature. And during seismic loading, even less, because the building is so flexible compared to the input that it just responds in its natural mode with a little bit of high frequency. And therefore, this temperature effect, which we studied very carefully, this is some results from a thermochem, uh, which is basically a non-contact temperature measurement that we used to track. This is output from the thermochem, and you can see over uh, 4,000 seconds the temperature rise that we get. Now, I'd like to talk to you very briefly at some examples. These are some, uh, this is a very slender tower in Toronto designed by Hal Croyalis. The designers asked us to redesign it with these VCDs, so that's what we did. Had about 140 VCDs that added 3% damping in the lateral mode and 6% in torsion. When you add damping to your lateral walls, you automatically add damping to torsion because it's the same walls that are actually engaged in your torsional response of a building. And here's some of the economics. Basically, remove three walls from the structure. You can see here the tanks. They're all on this side because they're during construction, so they were moved across the top here. Remove the three walls of four tuned liquid column dampers. Uh, this was estimated to about $4.5 million of savings. 9,000 square, foot, square feet throughout the building, just removing those walls over the number of stories. 4,000 square feet at the top, estimated about $9 million. And the damper cost for this application was about $2.5 million. So you can see here, tremendous value for the developer. This was another very interesting uh, uh, structure designed by Hal Croyalis. This is under construction currently as a 75-story tower, but at the time, they asked us to do something is to take their original 75-story design that was already approved, foundations had started, and to redesign it without changing anything to the structural elements or to the foundations as taller by 10 stories by using added damping. And what we did is we, we used 200 of these VCDs, and with the VCDs, they were able to add four penthouse floors, 10 typical floors, for a damper cost of $4 million, and it was estimated that the revenue to the developer would be in the order of $30 million coming from the extra 10 stories. So just uh, finishing up, this is a structure that was designed by uh, MKA as part of a peer project, and this is a, a structure that we've looked at where we've taken out every single coupling beam in the structure and replaced it by VCDs, looking purely at the seismic response. And we get a very, very interesting benefit from this. Um, basically, this design here called for a shear link and the V, so the a VCD has shear yielding instead of flexural yielding. And some of the results we're getting are of great interest if you're talking to your clients about performance-based design. So what I'm showing here, this is the service level earthquake. So 50% probability in 50 years. And this is the maximum credible earthquake. So if I start from here, you find that when you compare the response of the structure with the VCDs to a conventional ductile reinforced concrete wall system, you get a similar response, which is expected, because you're not going to dissipate more energy than a yielding coupling beam. You're going to dissipate similar energy. So this is fine. However, this is what happens when you look at the SLE. We're getting reductions of floor accelerations of 30%. Story shears by 25% and intrastory drift by 30%. And this, if you're looking at the effect that the frequent earthquake has, which is actually governing designs in Seattle and other West North American cities, this has a tremendous effect with a similar MCE design. Now, we looked at deformation demands that would require replacement or heavy repair of the coupling beams. And if you look at a conventional structure, we found that about two-thirds of the coupling beams would have to be repaired or completely replaced. And we're talking two-thirds over the height of these tall buildings with six or seven coupling locations per floor. This is a tremendous amount of repair, probably more economical to demolish the structure. And if you look at the response with the VCDs, this is a replaceable element. It's modular. And you can see here that it's been designed for this, that we neither exceed 
the plastic inelastic demand in the connecting elements, nor do we exceed the 400% strain capacity of the viscoelastic material. So it would basically require almost no repair under a maximum credible earthquake. So again, a summary of performance for the seismic, uh, the seismic response, substantial improvement for the lower amplitude earthquakes, and a similar performance for the higher amplitude, but with the ability to actually repair rapidly rather than live with all this damage. So as designers in this room, you, you might ask, how do you actually work and do this? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this company, Kinetica Dynamics, that's actually doing this. So conventional design without damper, you'd develop your conventional design. You would then take out some of your coupling beams and put in VCDs, which would give you the damping that you need primarily for wind. Then you would do a bounded analysis with the properties and E-tabs. You have the elements and E-tabs to do this. Then you would interact with the wind tunnel for the assessment of the damp response. And unlike sloshing uh, 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 dampers or tuned mass dampers, you can actually use this damping. It's real viscous distributed damping to reduce your wind loads. Okay, so that's another big advantage. Then you can go into the, the West Coast. American West Coast firms are all using uh, now PERFORM for their final time history analyses. So you can implement the damper response and PERFORM. And then you can finish with the detailing of your connections that fit the construction type to make these modular and to minimize the impact on the construction. So basically, you would take this tower, ETABS model, you would replace some of your coupling beams with the VCDs, and then you would assess the performance of the structure and move on for your detailed design. So as I mentioned, this technology is now marketed through uh, this uh, company, Kinetica Dynamics, uh, which provides technical support and uh, any other information that is needed for the designer to go through their design. The damper is manufactured by Nippon Steel Engineering, so you can see here the laying of the V uh, material, and you can see here the construction and final painting of the device before it's shipped out. So in conclusions, uh, basically the system offers increased damping, safety, does design efficiency, building height, leasable space, decreases wind and earthquake response, structural loads, construction costs, structural materials, and vibration perception. So really, I think it really opens the door for much more efficient and resilient designs. So I'd like to end with uh, just acknowledging some of the people that have contributed to this and some of the partners that have helped us develop this uh, through the years, and not least of all, the, the students at U of T that have done a lot of the work over the years. Thank you.